I know there's bound to be somebody who is supposed to introduce our governor, but before they get a chance to do that, ladies and gentlemen, will you join me in giving a warm West Virginia standing welcome to Governor Jim Justice. Thank you, Governor Justice. Sure, sure. <laughs> okay. I'm going to just join you right here, talk with you a few moments. You know, manufacturers and chamber, you know, you're our leaders, aren't you? You know you are. And you know that things are better. You know still that we've got a lot to do. I'm just going to talk with you just one second about just this. You know, <clears throat> I've thought about this a lot recently. And I don't say this in any way for a pat on the back or anything egotistical in any way. But it's not very often, in fact it may be never, that you really truly have somebody that you, a business person, a manufacturer, somebody that really understands, understands the goodness of providing a job and meeting a payroll. You really don't very often have someone that who's willing to step forward and say, I'm willing to serve. I'm willing to serve. Now, with that comes all kinds of crap, you know that, and everything, but at the end of the day, not only am I willing to serve, I'm willing to serve and not seek the next house office or the next hot business tip or whatever it may be. I'm willing to serve for you. For all those people that are out in the halls here and all the people that are all the way across the state. Now there's times when it becomes frustrating because I know I'm bringing to the table a different perspective, wisdom, Wisdom from a perspective that we've proven how to be dead last. You know, politicians, not to take anything away from them in the past, but we've proved how to pitch 50th over and over and over. Now, what I'm trying to do with all my soul is change the tide. Change the tide because we deserve to have the tide changed. Now, a lot of times, you know, whether it be the news media or colleagues or next person that's seeking, you know, a higher office themselves, or whomever it may be, they select to just throw a sound bite, throw a rock, you know. I had, I had this come up the other day. You know, a beautiful person, you know, texted me and said, because they asked me, after we got, went through all these announcements of everything from another month, of greatness, greatness, greatness on our revenue, to all the different things that we were doing, giving away grants, all the successes that are happening in your neighborhoods every day, whether it be roads or education or whatever it may be. They asked me this. The question was, you know, why did you really, you know, uh, put out an executive order to close all state institutions, schools and everything? when President Bush passed away and his, his services were that day. And then their answer was really simple. You know, I thought a lot about it, and when we got the thing from President Trump, President Trump was closing all the federal agencies. Well, you couldn't go to, you couldn't go hardly to the bank or the post office or whatever it may be. And you know, that was important. And he really probably thought it was important so I think I ought to at least think it's important. But I think it's deeply important. Because we lost a president. Not often do we lose a president. But you know what was even more important to me? 
It was just this. It was just that the fact that the kids today are living in such a high-paced, you know, cell phone, whatever it may be, computer, internet, whatever it may be, world, that we often lose contact with the very things that should mean the most. So I wanted our kids, even though I knew they'd celebrate being out of school, I wanted our kids to have the opportunity to be able, just maybe, to catch a bit of TV, and if not that, to just remember that somebody, me, somebody, thought it was important enough for them to be out of school because it is important. Well, you see, then came this scenario. Then came from this news person said, you know, you know I'm the one to always ask the tough questions. Well, I don't mean to be derogatory in any way, but that's a tough question. You know, really? Really and truly? What have we gotten to when we really, you know, and, and, and I would be first to say, you know, if there are tough questions, I'd say, let me have it. If I've done something wrong, let me have it. But at some point in time, we've got to grow out of this soundbite thing, and we've got to get on with what we should do, each and every one of us. We should get on with what we should do for the goodness of the state. Now, you've got a guy, really and truly, that's got a lot of wisdom. He's done a lot of stuff, and I've made so many mistakes, it's unbelievable. You know, from agriculture to education to coal mining to oil and gas, to everything you can imagine, to hospitality, on and on and on. And I've made more mistakes and Carter's got liver pills. Now, but in that you learn. So I would always do this. I would always, instead of looking for the next sound bite or whatever it may be, I would absolutely take pause to listen to the wisdom every now and then. Because you see, all I want is goodness for each and every one of you. Now, our manuf manufacturers, I think, I think employ about 6% of our workforce and maybe 10% of our total dollars generated in this state. And all you great, great, great chamber people, and you know, you know what you do. For crying out loud, today is a day in this state we should celebrate with pause. We should celebrate the fact that we're growing. We're growing at a growth, an annualized growth rate is the most bizarre thing in the world. 13.2%. It is phenomenal. That's all there is to it. Can it get better? Sure. I'm sure it can get better. The other thing is yesterday, you may not know this, but yesterday the Energy Department came out and basically endorsed again our natural gas hub. Now, and endorsed it because they said that it is vital to Homeland Security. Can you imagine, can you just imagine if this becomes a reality, the footprint that it will change in West Virginia? It will be unbelievable what will happen. They have in front of them right now my timber plant that is real. It's not just hocus pocus, it's real. They have right in front of them, and the reason they haven't acted on this is because really and truly, the coal plan that really, I mean, let me just touch on this real quick. And I hate to bore you, I hate to take up too much time, but, I, but you really should hear this. I went to the president with an idea, and the idea was basically this. Some way, somehow, I've got to convince the president to be afraid. To be afraid. If we become solely dependent and we lose our eastern coal fields, we lose them because we can't compete with the marketplace. And we completely lose them. What is going to happen to us in the east, in all of our power grid, all of our utilities, if we are totally dependent upon natural gas and totally dependent upon western coal? I said, Mr. President, I'm sitting right in the Oval Office, just he and I. I, in fact, to be perfectly honest, and I've told you this, I think, before, but, you know, Donald's a great friend. 
But, you know, I'm, I don't know why I did this, but he's bouncing all over the wall because he's got to come at him like you can't imagine. And so I finally, because he wouldn't really focus, and I finally just reached across the desk and grabbed him by his shoulders, and I said, Donald, you've got to listen to me here. And then I said to myself, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> and, then, and then I said, Donald, what if? What if we were solely dependent upon natural gas and western coal in the eastern power grid? And then what if you took a bomb and put it on a junction point where all kinds of gas lines were, were coming together, and I took a bomb and put it on one western bridge? What would happen, Donald? What would happen? What would happen if the eastern coal fields were gone? All the deep mines were flooded. You know, all the reclamation done. What would happen? And he looked at me and said, oh, hell, I get it. And so we took off. We took off with this plan. Now, the reason we, it just had, and, and the plan was basically this, to devise some kind of homeland security incentive payment to the power companies that would buy Northern App or Central App Coal. It covered multiple states. You know that. Now, and it, and it would keep the eastern coal fields viable for as long as we need them to be viable. Because if we lose them, they're gone. And we're up New Creek if we lose them. So, now, in all that, the coal market has rebounded and stayed halfway strong. And, and we've got a lot, a lot, a lot of our coal miners back to work. So it's not like we need to rush this to the finish line. But it's there. So just think, just think. In November, another surplus, $18.8 million, all kinds of goodness, month after month after month after month. We're running at a pace of about $200 million ahead of my budget, you know, and, and we'll probably finish the year somewhere in the 250 to 300 million. Can you imagine that kind of money in West Virginia? I mean, yeah, can you imagine it? Now, I see President Carmichael here, and I know Roger Hanshaw was here because he came to my basketball game last night. Thanks for coming, Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> but, but nevertheless, uh, uh, you know, we have a new speaker, a great speaker. We have a great president. And they do great work. And I'm sure there's many, many legislators here, and they do great work. I wish, really and truly, at times they would pause as the media or whomever would pause to say, damn, this man's got real wisdom, and all he's trying to do is take us all there. That's all he's trying to do. You know, now, let me just say that at the end of the day, we are moving. You do great work. You've got to get behind the movement of what we're doing in every way, shape, form, or fashion because we're on the go right now. We're becoming, we're becoming the diamond in the rough that everybody thought about rather than that ignorant, dark, dingy, dusty, whatever place, backward. You know, we're not that man. We're all of a sudden a diamond in the rough that they just missed. So anyway, I would tell you, whether it's Rebecca McVale, Steve Roberts, your leaders, I would tell you just this. If you think that we're not going to awaken at some point in time to some version of some deal with China or whomever it may be, you know, whether it may be Cutter or whomever it may be, if you don't think this natural, natural gas hub is a reality, you're missing it. You're totally missing it. Now, and I am telling you, our coal miners are back, and they're just going to keep coming back and everything else, unless, if God forbid, we elect another president, you know, and, and please tell me that's not going to happen. You know, and so with all that being said, we have put real priorities on education. We're curing that shortfall, and we're absolutely making a commitment that if you come to West Virginia, we're going to have great teachers, we're going to have great schools, 
We're going to have a great place for your people, your kids to be educated. We believe in higher ed. We're, we absolutely, you know, Mitch has talked many, many times to me about this, and Mitch deserves many kudos about this, but in all honesty, we've got to train a better workforce. That's all there is to it. Now, I'm going to end by just saying this, and I'm going to make it really, really simple, I think. But at the end of the day, in my eyes, here's what I think. You know, really and truly, if you've got good roads in West Virginia, and we don't have great roads yet, but we're making them better. We're doing lots and lots and lots of stuff there. And you've got a qualified, genuinely, really good, active workforce that we are training every day. We need to be so aggressive at doing some version of either free community or free technology or something to be able to get a workforce prepared beyond belief within West Virginia. But if you have those two things and you add to it a vibrant, really productive education system within the state, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we're going to go. We're going to go and we're going to do great, great things. Just think, just think. I've said it over and over and over. There may be someone here that doesn't quite get this. Think about a place, and this is so easy for me, because I really believe all these ideas come to me from the good Lord. And I'm not smart enough to come up with this, no way. But I said way back when in one of the debates, I said, what if, you, what if, you, what if we could have a place, and it would have four of the greatest seasons on the planet we do have, and then what if that place was located within 600 miles or a rock's throat of two-thirds of the people in the country? That is us. And then what if that place abound in natural resources beyond belief? Just think what we've got. The greatest coal. Natural gas in abundance that nobody else has. Absolutely tremendous timber and unbelievable water. What state has this? That's three. The four is we have the best people on the planet. We have faith-based people, community people, family people. Absolutely, we are the very best. Think about that. How in the world can we put pitch 50th? I'll tell you the answer. I'll tell you the answer. You've been run a long, long, long time by a group that was constantly perpetuating, getting reelected, getting reelected, getting reelected. They really never had the vision to take you there. And I can. I really can. But nevertheless, I can't without all y'all. You're the drivers. You're everything. So if Mitch and Roger will now dismiss me, I'll be dismissed. And I guess, Mitch, we'll find a way to forgive you for not coming to the game. Oh. <laughs> Thank y'all.